Bonjour encore. Um, it is my great pleasure to uh, introduce our keynote for the day and a friend of mine for many years, uh, Dr. Heidi Wasson of Concordia University in Montreal. Um, Heidi is professor of film and media in the School of Cinema at Concordia. She's the author and editor of four books, including the award-winning Museum Movies, um, Inventing Film Studies with Lee Greveson, Useful Cinema edited with Charles Ackland, and Cinema's uh, Military Industrial Complex again with Greveson. She's the founder of Field Notes, a multi-year oral history project on the history of film and media studies in the um, Journal of the Cinema and Media Studies Association, and the recipient of their Distinguished Service Award recently, too. Um, she's a founding member as well of Artemis um, for the history of film, technology, and theory. Um, her current research that she'll be presenting today investigates the expansive use of film projectors in a range of institutions, including uh, major industry, military, and government. And um, she'll be exploring the transformation of cinema from an entertainment machine into a highly diversified display and performance device. And her titles here on screen uh, the Interfaces of Projection, Mapping the Rise of Portable Film Devices. Heidi. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul. Um, thank you all for coming. It's a real honor to be here with so many people who know so much about film technology. I have uh, a lot of material, so I'm going to get started. So what I, what I thought I would do today is share some of my ongoing research with you in the hopes that it might help contextualize some of the objects and the experiences of using them, operating them, playing with them here in the collection. So what I've been working on is a, a, a long, I call it the slow research. Uh, it's a long format research project uh, on the history of portable projectors. Uh, my focus has largely been American and I have concentrated on what I think is a crucial period beginning in the late teens and into mid-century when small gauge portable projectors were standardized, manufactured, and marketed on a mass scale. And importantly, not just made, but institutionalized by, broadly speaking, powerful institutions, which themselves normalized the use of these projectors in relation to the things they did, their mandates to govern, to wage war, to make money, to educate, to entertain, uh, and even sometimes to show and engage with art. As I have been digging around and shoring up material, it's clear that these projectors constituted a significant, highly visible, everyday technological platform, one that was widespread, and broadly, deeply institutionalized. So these weren't minor developments. In other words, the history of portable projectors, particularly with the start of World War II and through to the rise of video in the 1980s, constituted a major technological platform for the presentation and performance of moving images and sounds. Now, in film scholarship and in popular memory, its existence and importance, that is, this uh, infrastructure for portable projectors has largely been overshadowed by its fancier, shinier, louder, and more spectacular iteration, which looked something like this, that is the movie theater. I began this research thinking actually that portable projectors were elements of subcultural and otherwise marginal practices. They were machines for amateur use or home use, a tinkerer's toy, a specialist's hobby and certainly always the sad and inferior cousin, the negative or utilitarian image of this. Uh, these low-tech, low-res, do-it-yourself machines, when mentioned at all, were often situated in film scholarship expressly as the negative, literally as non-theatrical. Uh, in the emerging scholarship on non-theatrical, films, uh, usually grouped as an umbrella term. That term usually names amateur, industrial, educational, and governmental cinema. Um, this important body of scholarship is charting a sizable body of activity and countless films. Portable projectors, sadly, are often implied or simply presumed, 
but certainly incidental to the other primary questions being asked. So what I'm trying to do is essentially explain how did all of those films get seen? Right? How did this infrastructure for viewing get built? Um, one of the things that's clear to me is that thinking about portable projectors in the negative, that is, as non-theatrical technologies, is a little bit like calling the internet non-television. In other words, it's an illogical and distorting term that hinders more than helps our understanding. Um, and it certainly does nothing to help us understand how this very major platform came to exist, what its specific dynamics were, and why it was important. And importantly, the question of scale is crucial. So when I started this project, I thought, oh, I'm going to have a, a, a chapter on this odd projector and that odd projector. And I thought I would be that uh, media archaeologist archeo that finds that odd thing and then writes it up. Um, but then I realized that there was actually a much bigger story to tell uh, about many, many, many machines and their standardization. So let me just give you a sense of the scale that I've not even on purpose, but stumbled upon. So for instance, from World War II onward, portable projectors handily and significantly exceeded movie theaters in raw numbers. So these are all American figures. In the United States, by 1959, portable projectors outnumbered commercial movie theaters by a factor of 259 to 1. These devices only continued to proliferate, and by 1960, they outnumbered movie theaters by a ratio of 650 to 1. By 1980, this ratio grew to an estimated 1,000 to 1. And though for those of you, because this is a very learned film technology crew, this is 8 and 16 in the United States. These numbers make portable projection a basic fact of film and media history and a set of foundational capacities to be explored. Moreover, the fact of this viewing infrastructure also plainly complicates the status of the movie theater as the historically situated and de facto site of American film. And I think it's probably also true for other parts of the world, but I, I have yet to get to start mapping that. Hopefully somebody will come along and help me. Um, and I think this resonates with what Ian Christie was saying yesterday. He blamed Bazin, um, which is a bit odd, but I take his basic point, which is that we have a, our view of cinema at mid-century is dominated by a pristine idea about the movie theater, and it's too narrow. We need to complicate that and open that up, and this is, this is my argument. So neglecting to consider portable projectors as distinct elements of a film and media history is to overlook the most common, the most accessible, the most quotidian means, as well as the most coercive and also radical means by which films have been shown, watched, heard, and engaged with during the post-war period and for a large part of the 20th century. To ignore these devices would also be to overlook the ways in which they normalized moving images and sounds, which became less events or evenings out, and more elemental aspects of a whole way of mediated life. In this sense, portable devices demonstrate key continuities from cinema's past and certainly at mid-century to our digital present, much more than radical breaks from it. So with this project, I am asking what might we learn from writing a history of film through the framework of portability, a media form known most commonly as one of the least portable of the 20th century, certainly from the time in the American context of uh, the establishment of the movie theater from the mid-teens forward as the dominant uh, interface with film. Uh, so my project contends that taking portable projectors seriously entails, among other things, dislodging that movie theater as the historical and dominant place where film happened, where it became something that people watched, engaged with, interfaced with, and instead, to approach uh, these things, these projectors, it, what it does is invite us to consider not just the many other places film has appeared, but what, what reconceptualizing a particular viewing platform, the capacity to show and see a film, did to the content, the delivery, the use, the aesthetics, and the performance of moving images and sounds at mid-century, dislodging the commercial entertainment industry and setting in motion many, many others. 
So since we're gathered here today as part of a kind of exploratory process, I thought I would frame my research as a series of insights gathered, like notes from the field, things I've learned as I've been digging, um, or things I've had to unlearn, uh, also equally important, that have helped me to think about these technologies in the hopes that they might spur a conversation with you afterwards in the hallways over beer uh, about how to approach film and film history through its various materialities. In this case, I'm concentrating on portable projectors, but hopefully some of these questions are applicable to other, uh, other devices. So I just want to um, uh, do a little what we call throat clearing, conceptual throat clearing, a little establishing some of the groundwork that I've been using or the assumptions that I've walked into this uh, project with. Um, and then I'll, I'll get on to the various parts of the paper that are more specific, where I both tell a story and, and then give you the, the upshot or that, that lesson that I've learned. So uh, point number one or framework number one that's been important to me. Focusing on portable projectors has required me to think about film as a shifting family of technologies, protocols, and practices that did not emerge at a single time or place or settle as one thing, but rather was continually transformed throughout the 20th century. We've been really good on the early period, pre-institutionalization, but one of the things I'm learning is uh, th those settlements didn't uh, entail um, that all other developments stopped. In other words, this history of portability of small gauge continued right alongside all of those other developments that we know and tend to think of as, um, as dominant. So once you start looking at the many, many parts of the apparatus, cameras, celluloid lenses, the hi apparently the history of glass is crucial, so we learned from the last paper, we have to accept that film has never been simply one thing but a shifting series of temporary agreements amongst various forms of innovation, chemical, electrical, mechanical, optical. The protocols that have brought those things together into a coherent material form, a 35 millimeter camera, an eight millimeter projector, and then a set of socially and culturally recognizable modes through which they became meaningful to us. Experimental art, educational film, military training, and so on and so on. So once we can just start to distill the parts of that thing, the apparatus, that we thought was coherent or we think evolved in a linear fashion, the myth of a singular cinema quickly dissolves. And instead, we see a whole series of through lines to films past, which do not begin in one place or end in another. Rather, they emerge and re-emerge in waves major and minor. They reform, they regress, sometimes they move sideways. And if one accepts this, uh, received film histories become not wrong, but smaller elements of a larger and broader story still to be told. Um, and I, my simple example in this parallels what Ian Christie was saying yesterday, if you just take the idea that cinema has properly and rightly uh, become bigger, more realistic, or more immersive, if you also know that at exactly the same time that films also got smaller, more affordable, more low res, easier to move around, we can see entirely a uh, different set of intertwined and dialogical movements, one monumental, expensive, usually corporate, prohibitive, spectacular, possibly beautiful, and the other, modest, affordable, inclusive, and low res. More apparatus, small ones, big ones, adaptable ones, architectural ones, does not de facto mean good or bad ones, but it does entail an opening up of our approach to film technology as a helpful first step for invigorating our most basic approach to what film has been, where it has happened, what it looked like, what it meant, why it mattered. There were many, uh, on, this, on the theme of portable projectors, there were many different kinds of projectors. This sea of machines itself is, you can go into the forest and you will find different clusterings. Um, they were smart, they were dumb, they were small, they were big, they were expensive, they were cheap. Projectors enabled entirely different kinds of films and film shows, diversifying the purposes to which films might be put and hence exercising a particular kind of creative force in their own right. They also importantly enabled highly variable informal economies of film circulation and presentation, like books, records, or videotapes, making film into a thing that was lent, borrowed, moved around. It could be programmed, could be put on a shelf because these machines created the capacity for that uh, accrual of texts. Um, so just to repeat, uh, my first and key frame is that film has long been throughout its history, not just in its earliest years, a complex family of technologies, iterative and not singular. 
So the second uh, uh, rationale is I've been reading a lot of media history. Um, that is, it seems quite clear that there's a lot that we film scholars have to gain by reading the work of media historians interested in technologies like the phonograph, the radio, the television, and even the internet. This is not because I think that film is reducible to any of these other media, but that the basic approach of how a technology acquires a set of social, cultural, and aesthetic functions is not a question exclusively of interest to film folk. Most important for me has been the claims of people like Lisa Gittleman, um, who actually writes a little bit about Edison, um, who asserts that we can think about media as assemblages, as shifting coherences of technologies, protocols, and practices for which change is neither linear nor uniform through time or across contexts. This basic historiographical approach to media allows us to ask crucial questions about how particular media evolved, but also importantly, how they evolved in relation to each other and is integral to any number of others, right? So it's an intermedial argument, which you've already heard uh, particularly by uh, Germain this morning. Um, So if we accept this proposition, uh, it becomes really difficult to think about singular timelines or singular story arcs that reduce technological complexity. And in this spirit, my project is less concerned with firsts or origins per se, but more about the undulating ways in which film technologies came in and out of contact with other technologies and sociocultural operations some of which emerged before, some alongside, and some after what we all think of as film's emergence at the turn of the previous century. So in other words, breaking apart the apparatus allows us to think about multiple and not singular timelines and phases of coherence. Okay, so on that whole, I'm suggesting here that distilling parts from the whole can be a highly productive method for shaking up stale narratives and explanatory frameworks. So in here, I want to highlight four, here are my four core themes uh, for the rest of the paper. I want to talk a little bit about portability. I've always, uh, I focus on particular gauges at particular moments throughout the project, but really for me it's about portability which then manifests in particular ways in particular film formats. So I'm going to say a little bit about portability and why I think that's productive for us as film scholars. Um, and then three subsets of the actual research that have yielded things that have been very productive for me and I think for others, hopefully. Um, one, I've learned a little a way to think about the business of American cinema differently. Two, uh, a diversification of forms and functions that these projectors have led me to think about. And then lastly, uh, a multimedial hybridity. In other words, it's quite clear that these projectors, you can't just think about celluloid. It's, it, they've always long been connected to these other kind of Frankensteinian hybrid intermedial uh, devices. So I want to talk a little bit about that. Okay, so just a few notes on portability. I would suggest that the portability of film is part of a broader history of portable media. While we know that in our contemporary moment, media can fly, orbit, and float, it is also true that media move with our bodies. We carry phones, MP3 players, and computers. We reach for them in our pockets, our purses, backpacks, briefcases. And as John Cusack taught us almost 40 years ago now, we hold them high above our heads. But this, <coughs> does anybody get to say anything joke there? Nobody knows John Cusack? Okay, for goodness sakes, people. Okay. <laughs> but this intensely embodied human scale of media movement was not inevitable or preordained. It evolved over years, catalyzed in fits and starts by technical innovations, institutional dynamics, and cultural practices. With regards to media history, portability has a complex and highly differentiated past, manifesting variously across media, including film. Importantly, portability, I would argue, is an enduring concept, but also highly relative. So in other words, portability means something different once a movie theater is a, uh, a major iteration of the form, for instance. Um, so at first level, we've tended to talk about a particular medium as portable because of a physical property, such as weight or size, responding to the basic uh, question, can I carry it? Media design practices have long articulated machines to the human body. For instance, carrying cases, handles, straps, and belt clips are integral to our media. 
Uh, and you can notice in the collection here, the preponderance of handles are very crucial to how one even just moves the device around. Um, adapting Marshall McLuhan's lasting insight that media can be understood as extensions of our physical and sensing cells. Inversely, media can also be thought of as part of our everyday load, adding heft, weight, and even a particular silhouette or gait to our self-carriage. These imbrications are enduring, but they also had to be made and often sold to us. So just a few quick, um, uh, it's been very helpful to, to know, to dig a little bit into other media forms. So this is actually uh, a, an ad for a film projector in a carrying case. There were um, Phonographs were actually designed to be movable and not architecturally conceived as sound devices. So a lot of them were designed with carrying cases and straps. Um, this is a, a design by Norman Belgettis, who is a modernist uh, industrial designer. Um, this is a fantastic uh, report. In the 40s, he submitted a report to RCA who was looking into how to persuade people to carry music with them because they thought nobody would ever want to carry music. So he actually conducted a study that was hypothetical. Well, you could turn it into a sack. You could put it in your pocket. You could carry it on your shoulder. Um, and, and RCA said, no way, no one will ever buy it. And then it, of course, emerges years later. Um, uh, portable uh, uh, radios emerge after the war more commonly. And then, of course, portable televisions, all with handles, uh, making them easy to move. So just as the term portability indicates a common sense approach to physical heft, the term is also entangled with other kinds of large and smaller scale movements. Recent work by Lisa Parks and Nicole Starosielski reminds us that media movement or what they call signal traffic requires what are frequently unrecognized but significant material and geopolitical systems that are constitutive of foundational media dynamics. So how do media move? We need roads, we need railways, uh, paths of flight and so on. The use of the term port in portability also signifies hubs and nodes of sizable physical transfer. So in English, shipping ports, ports of entry, ports of call. More recently, and evolved from this infrastructural use, the term also helps to name the transfer of content and interoperability of electronic and digital signals, facilitating particular kinds of media traffic. Devices often come with many ports allowing other devices to become interoperable and constitutive of hybridity. Crucially, port ability, the ability to port, can lead away from concepts of site specificity and medium specificity and toward adaptability and multiple functions and phenomenologies. And it is this double sense of the term port that I want to enact here when thinking about film technologies. Focusing on devices that can move at a particular scale, but also be thought of as hubs for a range of images, sounds, performances, and functions. So port able, the ability to port, also signals as much an imminent capacity as a fact. So one of the things I've had to get my head around is I don't, I, that sea of machines that I showed you earlier, I can't know what every single machine did or how it was used. But it, the very fact of its existence indicates to me an everyday capacity for these kinds of uh, mutations, media mutations, to occur. And that in and of itself has helped keep me sane in moments when there were just too many things to, to know. So just as the concept of a port opens up the possibilities of a busy and dynamic intersection for a device, it's also important to consider portability through the lens of legal or regulatory frameworks. So where and how a particular device might be purchased, installed, operated, transported are all signposts of complex systems that shape and direct the ways media movement and non-movement becomes recognizable to us. For the history of moving images, the related concept of access and value are crucially linked to portability. So forgive me this little side uh, bar. I was a bad art historian in another life. Um, but it seems like a useful little sidebar. So just give me this moment for a second. Similar to movie theaters, take the case of the art museum, which likewise operates to direct and constrain the movement of art. A good deal of the art world remains predicated on creating value based on concepts of originality and singularity, which enshrine scarcity and hence a degree of unportability. Uh, <clears throat> Think of the ways in which ostensibly priceless paintings like the Mona Lisa, otherwise very small, 
very light in weight. The image itself measures uh, 30 inches by 21 inches, are understood as inextricably linked to an architectural destination, the Louvre, uh, an institutional apparatus, the art museum, and the particular geopolitical context, Paris, France. We might also add to that uh, the tourist and security regimes that evolved around art and its pricelessness, respectively. So with its frame and security box, the painting weighs 200 pounds. I don't know how much the tourists weigh, but you take my point. Important art is apparently very heavy, making what otherwise might be a carry-on painting into something else, anchored in place by architecture, institutional rituals, insurance companies, uh, tourist economies, and deep nationalism. Institutions of display, cultural rituals, hierarchies of value can reframe what uh, might otherwise be portable by common sense definitions, but transform them into something else. So, <clears throat> and I'll build on this later when I talk about how, uh, well, how I'm understanding movie theaters in relation to portability. So, following from this, I want to emphasize that I am not arguing that portability is good or bad. In certain instances, portability has been instrumental in progressive democratizations of entrenched institutions, and in others, it has led to tools which further geopolitical asymmetries and injustice. To be sure, portability is a relative and complex property, but it helps us to distinguish among more material dynamics as well as discursive ones. So for me, I, I find it very difficult to disentangle those two things. Portability plainly looks different across time and context making it a productive historical concept, naming a set of potentially dynamic properties that help us to think through the ways in which media design, modes of conveyance, movement, and adaptability have come to be made meaningful in our understanding of film's technological and institutional histories. Okay, so these are my little, we can think of them as case studies or little peeks into the larger project from which I will distill a deep and significant insight that I hope you'll take with you and consider as we leave here. So number one of these three is rethinking the business of film or what we think of as the studio system or the American film industry. So while my project among other things examines the moment in which 16 millimeter was standardized by the American technological industry in 1923, this became not the only but the dominant portable gauge until eight millimeter exceeded it 30 years later in the 50s. Um, the rise of 16 millimeter uh, was aided significantly by uh, things that were going on during World War II. Uh, it's quite clear that the Germans were also using 16, and so this technological apparatus grows quite rapidly in Europe during the war. Um, but my question really focuses on when portability moved from a casual way we might describe an apparatus, so we have histories of itinerants and so on in film history that precede mine that are important, but when did it switch from that to one that was fueled by the power of a, a whole industry's ascent and supported by mass consumer markets, a kind of everyday fact of industrial life? So the first, we know that the first cameras and projectors were de facto without any kind of permanent home and hence designed to be moved. Cinema was born portable. Um, yet film received histories, the received film histories presume that portability and itinerance in fairly short order became insignificant or marginal uh, once the coherent aesthetic conventions, business models, and retail outposts or movie theaters uh, formed and became what we call Hollywood, which took about 20 years. A more genealogical approach shows that the history of film technologies opens us up to a much more complex story. Key here is that portability endured throughout all of these years, throughout film history and alongside these other forms of settlement. Equally important is that as portable technologies consolidated and began to ascend, they did not do so in opposition to Hollywood or the commercial film industry. Counterintuitively, Small film technologies were, in fact, I argue, an effect of Hollywood's consolidation and vitality. In short, throughout the interwar period, the success of the commercial film industry was yielding a technical base that fed innovation and expansion of all film technologies, not only those used by the studios. So just to be clear, the American studio moguls were themselves pretty uninterested in portable film projectors. Uh, particularly in North America. 
uh, movie theaters were crucial for their business model, uh, securing distribution chains, steady locations, and repeat clientele. By the mid to late teens, movie theaters began to operate as ornate, high-tech ceremonial shrines to commercial cinema in the guise of picture palaces. Controlling theaters also helped the industry to control the circulation of film and its potentially limitless reproductive capacities. In other words, the film industry really only liked film's reproducibility, film copies, insofar as they enabled the growth of a highly controlled market. Movie theaters helped them to control that market, and thus uh, copies through safety protocols, insurance codes, and projectionist licensing. By the second half of the 1910s, the American film industry had grown and consolidated sufficiently that its various elements were establishing sub-organizations to help facilitate coordination across dispersed constituents. The studio's technical base, or what we might today call its research and development arm, was by and large organized outside of studio walls. Uh, as Lucy Marzola, who has a really nice manuscript on the founding of uh, the engineers organization, in Hollywood, she reminds us that Hollywood uh, was a client, a procurer of goods and services, as much as a maker of movies. It outsourced its technical infrastructure to the chemical, optical, electrical, and photographic industries, Eastman Kodak, Bell & Howell, DuPont, Bausch & Lomb, for lenses, and so on. These entities catered to studio needs, but they retained diversified interests across other industries. Um, I like showing this org chart because this is the engineer's view of the film industry uh, in 1924, and they have a completely different idea, not completely different, but a, a different idea about how to understand the film industry, primarily through their expertise of su supplying innovations and technologies and physical plant materials. Um, so importantly, their understanding of the film industry was not confined to entertainment but to thinking expansively about its technical base and the applications of the whole of that base and what its bits might entail. So when these engineers and technical industries came together under the organizing rubric of the Society for Motion Picture Engineers, which formed in 1916, they discussed all kinds of things that directly but also indirectly affected the studio's technical plant, including moving image technologies in the broadest sense. So this helps to explain the surprising fact that one of the earliest acts of this organization was to define portability and to identify shared standards to help expedite the development of a consumer-grade portable film projector. Under the shadow of French innovation, so Pathé was very important as a, like a, the, dark, the dark cloud on the American sky, um, the American discussion entailed a drive towards shared technical standards. What film gauge? How heavy the machine? How big and how bright the image? But most important of all was the matter of flammability. That is, portability was defined primarily by the ability not to catch fire. Film, as many of you will know, uh, had long been printed on nitrate stock, highly flammable. As such, all film shows were quickly regulated by public safety laws, but also uh, insurance codes. Um, such regulations focused on the movie theater, which through the 1920s was getting bigger and bigger, but they also logically entailed that portable shows, which persisted throughout this period, enact similar precautionary measures. So it was common that a licensed itinerant showman would arrive at the place of performance with a projector that perhaps weighed 50 pounds, but would also have a fireproof booth, which might weigh as much as 500. So public safety was pretty heavy. It weighed a lot, mitigating it against any common sense ideas about portability. And you'll also note the irony of protecting from nitrate fire with asbestos booths. So there's a, a kind of cruel history of chemistry uh, to be written uh, on this one. Portable machines were also counterindicated for threats like fire. In other words, the smaller the metal projector's box got, the hotter it was from the bulb's heat, the more likely was fire. Demands to make the image larger or brighter also entailed more heat. And so small, nimble projectors were a kind of Faustian bargain. The smaller the box, the more dangerous. The brighter and bigger the image, the more dangerous. Industry definitions of portability thus entail considerations of weight, ease of use, and affordability, but among these, uh, all, all were subsumed by the widely agreed upon necessity that it not catch fire. 
portability in film's technical history then can first and foremost be understood as an electrochemical innovation aimed at managing heat, effectively expediting the use of acetate or non-flammable film stock, which would take the commercial industry another 30 years to normalize. Flammability, and of course after that just damage, um, also entailed a series of bargains with image size, brightness, and speed, all of, which were, all of which were correlated to the most basic conditions in which film projection might work at all. Celluloid had to move past a hot bulb. All of these were critical um, and also helped to circumvent the weight that theatrical iterations of cinema entailed. For their part, engineers and designers understood the drive towards portability as a potentially new market for their products, which would enable moving images to address the cultural and commercial functions being addressed by other media. So film, to their minds, could replace or perhaps compete with books, newspapers, and magazines, as well as other modes of public presentation and display. These devices were also partly understood as a rejection of the movie theater's growing size and technical complexity. That is, not everybody thought that movie theaters should be big and huge and expensive and high tech and ahead of the technology curve. So this, this more nimble idea of cinema actually merged within a kind of internal resistance within the industry to that model of theatrical cinema. As such, the small affordable projector proposed a very different model for how film technologies might operate and become interwoven with other more nimble and adaptable media ecologies. So contemporary film and media industry studies tends to be highly attuned to the multi-platformed world we now inhabit, understood as more nimble, multi-layered, a jumble of patents, processes, platforms, and content interwoven across media and a complex web of technological change. But analogous to this, I'm suggesting an expanded understanding of the film industry in the teens and 20s helps us to better think about the way that the American film industry rose, not just as a maker of movies, but as, an in as interdependent with a complex technical ecology that thrived in relation to it. This yielded not a singular or coherent industrial vision, but a complex one that was yielding its own internal contradictions. Okay, so that's insight number one. Um, number two. So, <clears throat> frequently it is assumed that 16 millimeter projectors were born to service the amateur filmmaking market, which emerged plainly uh, and you know, easily identifiably emerges in the 20s, but we see it in the 30s evolving and then thriving for decades afterwards. I found that far more important during this period was a national network of projectors built not by the film industry and not by amateur filmmakers, but by other major American industries, cars, oil, farm equipment, electrical utilities. I found this amazing reference to a fact uh, in a journal from the period that uh, the second largest user of celluloid outside of Hollywood uh, was the car industry. So after Hollywood, you go to the car industry, they were using the most celluloid during the 30s, which is kind of an interesting uh, historical tidbit. As the growing body of scholarship on industrial film is showing, these companies were the early adapters of film, less as entertainment and more as a business machine. This, I should also add, is not specifically American. Uh, the Europeans were very big on industrial film. Um, yielding a range of film uses that included employee training and morale films, internal communications, retail and public relation films. Already in the 1930s, this was a highly evolved uh, site of filmmaking and film uh, use. By the 1930s, film was part of an increasingly complex industrial communications and display ecology that was a new way of presenting what American industry did, what it was for, and why it was, according to them, good or benevolent. Nowhere were these ecologies more spectacular than at the industrial and world's fairs that transpired throughout the decade, culminating in the 1939 World's Fair in New York. This fair stands as an index to the powerful modes of address being forged by American industry and state, summed up by the then new term industrial showmanship, industrial showmanship. 
public relations experts and industrial designers increasingly thought about industrial address and display as opportunities for putting on a show, turning oil or cars into projectable entertainment. So just, uh, I, I don't want to show clips because it will take too long. This is a, some of you may know this film, it's a fantastic animation or oil. It's actually quite maniacal film uh, called Pete Rolium and His Cousins, uh, 1939, and also A Coach for Cinderella. So uh, this is a story that takes the Cinderella myth, uh, but she gets taken to the ball in a car uh, and not a pumpkin carriage. It's very strange, but it, they were making basically making movies for ki industrial films for children, which is another kind of creepy side to the story. Um, the 1939 fair functioned as a kind of experimental stage where industrial designers crafted theme rides, immersive mediated environments, and elaborate buildings that entailed or included film projections into their design. It also included uh, 3D films. Um, this one was about uh, a car that magically uh, self-assembles stop motion animation in 3D. Um, this was one of the souvenir glasses that they give you at the 3D film. Um, and uh, film projectors played a particularly important role in these temporary, all fairs were very temporary, uh, event-based dream worlds. And I, one of the things, uh, I guess this is also spurred by uh, some of the things that Germain was saying, but also Ian, there's a lot of through lines to this technological story. And so I don't wanna create the impression that I have just a, a better a linear chronological story to tell you. I like this little sidebar, so I will show it to you very quickly. At the 1939 World's Fair, um, Fred Waller, who uh, w some of you may know uh, his role in developing Vitarama, which is understood as an early surround uh, 180 degree screen projection scenario that he developed for the petroleum building at the World's Fair. But he was also commissioned by Kodak uh, which was big on its color film at the time. And he designed this uh, circular uh, uh, 180 feet wide, 11 screens, 20 feet high, curved screen that uh, was, it was, it was still images, but they moved constantly. The projectors were on a timer. So the images were constantly popping and transforming and they were coordinated across this large uh, vista. Um, and between these uh, experiments, then Fred Waller during the war used the same principle of peripheral vision. He was kind of crazy. He was really interested in peripheral vision and he used to drive around his neighborhood with blinders on the front of his eyes to develop his peripheral vision while he was in a moving vehicle. Um, he was a very committed <laughs> researcher. Um, during the war, he takes these principles and interests in peripheral vision and the training of the sensory apparatus and develops a gunnery trainer that's used widely in the American military um, and in the UK especially. And it used five, at first it used 16 millimeter projectors and then I think in its final iteration it used 35, but it was five projectors across. Um, and of course then after the war, Fred, uh, he continues to work partly with the military and partly with, with Hollywood to develop Cinerama, making widescreen immersive films that look like this. Um, and other interesting side note, uh, interest comparable to the galvanometer uh, insight that Ian introduced to us yesterday, Fred Waller also invented water skis. So which helps to explain the deep relationship between water skiing and widescreen cinema. And what I think is important about this is the relationship between these temporary environments, these experimental industrial environments, and the fact that Cinerama, while itself, one might say, was not a major iteration of cinema or it faded, it of course was, was largely the catalyst for changing the shape of the commercial film screen for a very long time. So it's the, these small technologies become important in other large venues as well. So there's a dialogical relationship, not an antithetical one. They often work together. So back to the fair, just a little bit more. The fair boasted 34 purpose-built movie theaters, constituting an unusually dense clustering of films and their spaces. These theaters showed hundreds of documentary, industrial, publicity, and advertising films, often continuously morning until night. At the fair, many more moving images, so in addition to the 34 theaters, appeared in venues that could in no way be deemed theatrical, but instead made use of walls, 
floors, ceilings, small booths, and boxes, rear projection was a very important part of the portable uh, movement. Um, and they played these images that were often very small, uh, continuously and discontinuously, silent and not. And some of them were, um, fair goers would get to push a button and operate the projector or not. It really depended on, on the particular articulation and the display needs of that environment. Um, moving images addressed a range of spectatorial dispositions, focused, bedazzled, delighted, distracted, educated. Importantly, film performance unfolded within and nearby elaborate multimedia exhibits, wherein a visitor's eye ambled over uh, text, still images, objects, maps, diagrams, and working machines, and perhaps eventually also projected film. Pre-recorded and amplified sounds further filled these spaces. These were really complex audiovisual environments. Many fair exhibits embodied corporate image and aspiration. Uh, empl they employed a range of expressive tools. They espoused the virtues of technological progress, streamlined architecture, moving sidewalks, uh, rocket launches, which this is a part of. There was a film that was a part of an actual rocket launch. The rocket launch was the, the money shot of the film. It was a very strange film. Uh, frozen forest, talking cars, wisecracking robots. Projectors were integral to all of these futurisms. This environment in many ways resonates with the one that Fred Turner links to the history of immersive media, which he termed the democratic surround, linking Bauhausian principles of exhibition design to the ideologies of American democracy and individual choice. But here, we can see the ways in which films and film technologies were integral to these broader developments earlier than what he talks about. He mostly focuses on uh, post-war throughout the interwar period, linked not just to an emphasis on democratic minds, which is his primary argument, but also to productive consumerisms and ideas of industrial benevolence. Okay, this is my last bit. So I call this ecologies of small media, but this is about hybridity. So the ability to port for one media machine to link to another is a crucial part of the portable projector story. While there were many, many examples of projectors that simply showed a film, silent and sound, there were also many, many devices that played with the multiple relations of projected moving images and sounds that were ported in or simply played nearby, linking the projector to live and recorded sounds, small, hidden, and retractable screens that reflect and emit light, and importantly, microphones that amplify the voice. A lot of these devices came with microphone jacks. They were designed to be accompanied by live amplified voices. Here, projectors became hybrid, designed to be highly adaptable and open to a kind of media ad hocery and improvisation. And I just want to give you a few examples of that. So this is uh, from a 1941 issue of Popular Mechanics. It was featured as a modern marvel of intermedial engineering called, <laughs> it's a big mouthful, the Phonocine Radio Recordograph. This device merged a phonograph, a radio, an amplifier, a sound film projector, and a screen. It could record sounds, but also play them, summoning them from vinyl records, celluloid, or capturing them from the air. It could play a film on a small screen, which sat atop the device perched like a proud ornament in the center of the hulking console. Still years before television had proven itself commercially viable, the Phonocine Recordograph promised a highly integrated home entertainment unit, which the magazine dubbed Concentrated Entertainment, for its ability to bring sounds and images together in one magnificent media machine. The sizable device also offered media storage and a host of input ports. In other words, even at this size and multifunction, further adaptability was anticipated. Now, I don't want to claim this was portable. It weighed 800 pounds. Um, and it took, it was an amateur radio enthusiast who built it. It took him a year to do so. Um, the machine might best be understood as amateurism gone awry. 
madcap tinkering, or perhaps even science fiction. Indeed, it would be an odd one-off, but if it weren't for the fact that other similar devices, much lighter in weight, I should add, were also being designed and sold during the same period. This is the Victor Animatograph 40, called the Victor 40, also known as the Ada Unit, in production from 1939 to 1947. The projector espoused a default multimedia modularity at its core. It could be purchased with a range of lenses, uh, allowing varied projector placement closer to or further from the screen. It might be accompanied by a record player, a radio, a microphone, a sound recording unit, multiple speakers, and an auxiliary amplifying unit. The device invited users to create their own live or recorded soundtracks. It allowed them to turn the volume up or down to make the image bigger or smaller. The company claimed that the projector had the ability to play at different speeds and be stopped in order to project a single film frame in suspended form. It's another parallel part of the project that, uh, again, in, in, in consort with the discussions about lantern slides earlier this morning, it's very, very clear that in the discussions about portable projectors, the engineers all wanted the projector to stop and be variable speed. So they wanted people who used them to have full control over that, including stopping, and they just couldn't quite, um, they advertised that they could, but I suspect that they couldn't until, uh, until the 50s when they developed highly specialized devices that, that wouldn't melt the film when you stopped. But nonetheless, that discussion or that persistence of that wish to have full control over image speed up to the point of full stasis for as long as you wanted, that persists in these machines as well. So it's an, it's an interesting element of that. Uh, device. Back to the ADA unit. The ADA unit enabled a degree of control over all of the key, what I call the key vectors of projected film. Size, speed, volume, illumination, image clarity. It was also, I should note, a projector to be uh, incomplete. It was sold to be built and used according to need, desire, or whim by adding other related component parts to it. It was a kind of modular system. Presented also as an adaptable machine, uh, it was sold as a device for public presentations and performances. The projector also operated as a kind of base unit designed to be moved, carried, and rearticulated to a, a range of other media machines, spaces, and uses. Unlike the bulky phono cine radio recordograph, uh, but much like other portable projectors and screens of its day, the Victor 40 also came in a case integral to its design. A sturdy handle allowed it to be carried by a would-be projectionist's hand with ease. Though we also know these things were quite heavy. So portability, again, becomes a kind of, it's, it's lighter than a building, um, but, you know, okay. So an inventory of small devices from this period could continue. From the 1920s onward, projectors came in many styles with different degrees of function. And I just want to give you another example. This is after the war. Um, in addition to the long-standing pairing of microphones with portable projectors, innovations in magnetic recording and playback led to projectors that themselves became sound recording instruments as well. So projectors enabled users to record, erase, improve, or change the sound, and you could also strip your silent films with a magnetic strip so that you could turn them into sound films. Um, these devices were marketed to teachers, salesmen, managers, clergy, and also the military who actively used them in their overseas uh, multilingual situations. Um, some of them were sold as cosmopolitan business machines, uh, readily able to bridge linguistic and other barriers. These devices in their advertising campaigns all emphasized their ports, their interoperability, uh, and they were also sold as home devices often using the ontologies of liveness in individual private address. So here's a good just image of the uh, porting setup. And this is uh, the RCA 400. This was um, just a high-end sound projector. Well, to, to me, what's really interesting about this, for anybody familiar with the history of television, it's exactly how television was being sold at exactly the same time. These ontologies of liveness, the fidelity of the sound, like the, like the performers are in your living room, on your lap, whatever it is. <laughs> um, but that sense that this device brings them to you and you to them is very much the way television is being sold at exactly the same time. Ease of making and use was a prominent part of how they were also presented. 
In other words, the playback machine, the portable projector, became an easy do-it-yourself active tool of making and transformation, brokering in these ontologies we tend to think of as televisual or broadcast-based, or electronic at least. So uh, I have a, a little conclusion, but I thought I might not read it and just say a little something about um, uh, Ian Christie asked earlier today, why does it matter that historians or scholars can touch these things or handle these devices, uh, see them, use them? And uh, I, I can say that in the context of this project, uh, it, it would be unthinkable to write a project like this without having tried to lift up one of these projectors. They are so heavy. <laughs> Um, and to see the different ways in which they were designed. So there's some great projectors at USC in the Hugh Hefner archive um, from these days, and, and to see the military green standard issue projector for the American military during World War II is to understand the design imperative and the ways in which film technology was militarized. And I don't use it loosely. I mean, it was standard operating equipment in the American military, and it came in military green or navy blue. These things were really heavy. Um, but they were designed to be dropped from 10 feet up to the floor and still operate. They were rugged. They looked like tanks. Um, and that's very different, say, from the Kodak Kodoscope A's that are up top, which are clearly much more genteel technologies that needed to be handled very carefully, set down gently. So there's something about being able to see, feel, hold, um, tinker with these devices that are articulated to users um, to understand exactly First of all, our reliance on ad discourse is so distorting. Sometimes we start there, and we should never end there. Um, but to understand the disjuncture between the way a device was sold and then actually what it was, really crucial. And then also to understand that our ideas about technical capacity, ease of use, weight, these things are historically relative as well and change. So it's, it's, really, it's a really important touchstone to be able um, uh, to put your hands on it, to carry it around, to put your hand around the handle, and so on, to look in its innards uh, and understand some of the design imperatives, and which clearly leads to very different functions. So it helps to think about, in concrete ways, the diversity of the device and the ways in which it was being designed. So um, I thank you for inviting me here to see this collection, because it has very much helped to concretize a lot of those um, facts, and to also uh, remind me yet again that w we are at a, an important juncture in a critical mass of brains and minds and heads um, to start uh, really challenging ourselves to come up with different categories and typographies for these devices so that we can then start grouping them and figuring out with greater specificity what kind of scale they operated on, how many people had them, how important were they, um, and what were the, the, the key driving factors for making them successful or not. Um, with a sea of machines like the ones I'm dealing with, we're talking about millions and millions and millions of portable projectors, at a certain point it becomes, a, it's a polemical gesture, shouldn't we know more about this? Yes, we should. But after that, one needs to start carving up the forest and get more specific about the different kinds of devices and what they were doing. So thank you for that, and thank you for listening. Uh, you mentioned at the beginning that you were concentrating on the American product. Are you intending to expand in, in over to Europe? And I mean, since Anne is here, uh, thinking of things like Pate Roro uh, and uh, the esoteric uh, Ozophone. to know more about the European situation. It, um, I've been looking more closely at the post-war period, and it seems as if um, 16, in the American industry discourse, 16 seems to have become well aware that the American military uh, adopted 16 as their standard overseas gauge, um, that there was a path left behind. Um, and 
that, on top of the fact that apparently the Germans were quite actively using 16 as well, created an, an infrastructural capacity that I know the American studios saw as their next business opportunity. There was a post-war frenzy for using 16 as the new uh, form of internationally dominating the film scene just about everywhere. So I th it's that part of the story is crucial. How does the American standard become the world standard? Um, and, then, uh, and then all the other gauges that were competing that preceded it and existed alongside it are a crucial part of the story. I just, unfortunately, I, I'm not there yet. But I'd be happy to hear from anyone their sure bits. series of um, venues in which films could appear, planes would be one of them, trains would be another. Uh, there were all kinds of post-war, uh, like UNESCO and the UN used 16 in their movie vans. So you see this kind of crazy amphibious movie vans traveling throughout Africa. Um, so it became an instrument of post-war liberal governance. It, it was articulated to all manner. Um, daylight cinema becomes a really important part of this. So that you can show movies during the day anywhere you want. That was part of the rear projection imperative, which things like movie vans allowed, but all kinds of other rear, project, rear projection hoods. So like the, F, you know, it, it's, 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 yeah, it's big. Thank you. We, uh, we mentioned sound this morning, and I'm surprised by, the, by your last slide here, because you were talking about 16 millimeter films, talk about the machine to project, but the headline is that's the way it sounds. So I is it common for uh, uh, companies like that to advertise using the sound instead of the image when they are trying to sell you something that will project the image? Uh, well, I mean, R RCA uh, was a major war contractor and made a lot of projectors during the war and became a major manufacturer after the war. Um, so this this is was their latest, as I understand it, their latest... Um, sound projector and so they were selling a audio quality and I partly it's the silent story that um, I, th I mean the sound was notoriously bad even on sound projectors so they were constantly trying to improve the sound so it's common particularly for sound projectors to see the quality of the sound advertised as fantastic and then of course um, to see that undercut by the next projector which is fabulous and the one before it obviously probably wasn't so yes, it's common that they were advertised as sound machines and that the quality of the sound was a, was a prominent part particularly of the way 16 millimeter projectors in the post-war period were being advertised. Was it famous for different lighting and Yeah, 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 I guess that's right. I hadn't thought about it that way, but you're absolutely right. RCA had, because it was RCA, had a huge audio background, whereas a company like Victor didn't, yeah. or Graflet, or Ampro, or any of those others. Uh, and the, the amplifier in, in the 400 series is, 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 is quite good. Right. And Eastman, uh, Eastman uh, projectors had pretty good sound systems. Eastman was one of the ones that, the that had the adjustable focus. Because when you ran prints, you, you don't know exactly where focusing the soundtrack. So Eastman projectors had a little lever, and you could focus the, the optics from the, uh, goes to, from the exciter lamp to the track to the, to the optical relay that goes to the photo cell. And you could slide that up and down and, and focus the track. I had a quick question. Oh, sorry. I had a quick question about uh, uh, threading. Uh, <laughs> for having thread a uh, Victor Adamatophone is one of the most mind-boggling things in the world. Isn't it backwards? Like you're yeah, exactly. Down it goes or, backwards yeah. and it goes through all over the place. And it's one of the things that I discovered using, and I have to thank him again, uh, <laughs> Francois, because Francois has one that I he gladly, uh, I, I could bar borrow one from him. Uh, and it's, uh, it, it's fascinating because obviously threading comes with different issues. and. Victor, for instance, says anybody can thread this projector with the back, you know, with a, the hand tied behind its back, which isn't true. Um, I, I, is there anything like the way that the, the the path thread? Have you read specific things, or is this something that you're you're interested in delving into? I haven't, but you just triggered something that I must do, which is 
um, you know, one of the reasons that the war was so important is uh, technicians and engineers in the industry were working with members of the military to come up with a design protocol that would satisfy military needs. Um, uh, the Jan P49 was the protocol. And it actually isn't established until after the war, because it took them so long to figure it out. So during the war, they're just buying whatever they can buy. But I wonder if the protocol actually stipulates threading, it must stipulate threading standards um, for ease of use and so on. Um, and it would be something very important to check out. Because I know that about Victor, and they kept making them that way anyhow, um, which doesn't make that much sense, but they did it, and I don't know why. Um, so yeah, thanks. <laughs> But to just a footnote, I don't know all the design criteria of the Victor, but the two, the selling points and the ads for that threading path, the offset threading path is that it puts pressure against the side. So it minimizes weave as it goes into the gate. And then the second thing, as you know, it's full of the little trip rollers. So they always made a point that if you had a jam or you're in the classroom and something happened, it would trip and, and stop. If you lose your loop, it, it stops. You, you lose your loop, you're, you're yeah. fine. Yeah. Although it, it did take a while to figure it, but I, I used to thread them in school. You have to talk. Teach me how. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Check one. Um, I noticed uh, last week I was in the vault at Concordia looking at uh, all our titles. And at what Hollywood, I'm going to call Hollywood just as some giant monolithic American <coughs> dream, uh, weren't interested in portable 16 millimeter. But at some point they started releasing titles, major motion pictures. So at what point did Hollywood kind of go, hmm, there's something to this? Um, so during the war, they start issuing titles on 16 and giving them to the American military to show soldiers overseas. So that's the beginning of the deep marriage. They were doing it before that, but the deep marriage really takes off then. And then I'm still gathering the post-war story, but they... Right after the war, there's a huge concern about um, what we would today call bootleg or pirated copies leaving, escaping the military, and then getting out into circulation un, you know, unlicensed, un, um, unapproved circulation. And they actually hire lawyers. The FBI is on it, and they start investigating these renegade screenings of the prints they had given to the military, but benevolently, <laughs> um, and they want to, they want them burned, or like they certainly want them back. Um, and then I think what happens is they, they see that there's a market, but they don't want to mess with the theatrical model, and so the, the, the non-theatrical industry, which is what they called themselves then, they start issuing best practice guidelines for when you can rent a Hollywood feature for a 16 millimeter show, um, and it, it had there were all these stipulations built into the best practices because they were trying to make friends, right? Um, so it's things like you have to be four miles away from the closest commercial movie theater, um, stuff like that. So that they try to they try to set up an agreement about what's okay and won't interfere with the theatrical model, but theater owners are not happy about it, and so the the, the negotiations then carried on from there. Um, but I, they do issue them in 16, and they issue abridged versions, but I think they tend to issue titles that they were pretty sure weren't valuable to them anymore. So older, older, older titles, things like that. Yeah. Just a footnote. In Belgium, in the 60s and the 70s, we, we could uh, rent most of Hollywood films on 16 million. Yeah. Uh, some, uh, maybe a year later. Well, they were, again, I'm still piecing this together, but my assumption is is they were happy to distribute 16 millimeter prints of their films when they had no theatrical stakes. So, you know, they were, if the, if the theaters, if they didn't own, have any interest in the theatrical model in Belgium, 
they would have been less concerned and happy to distribute. So I, I don't know for sure the whole of the story. It must be more complicated than that. But it was some kind of negotiated situation where they didn't want to mess with their theaters, but if there was a market that didn't compromise that, they were happy to exploit it. So, I, yeah. But even even in um, cities, like even where they had theatrical, yeah, yeah. yeah. right. So We're everywhere all, else, yeah. yeah. Um, if if I could ask, it was a pretty radical idea to redefine portability as um, as fire safe and fire safety, and I just wanted to check because I've never thought of it before. Were sixteen mil safety film actually safe? Um, as far as I know. Are there, are there stories of fires and panics? In the beginning, the Soviet Union, but uh, <laughs> no, 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 no. Yeah, and it also, I mean, the, the, that, that safety of it, it, it has implications for how the films can move, right? So they're cheaper to send. They're smaller, but they're cheaper to send. They don't, you don't need a lead line case. Like, it, it frees up cinema in that big sense of that term for all kinds of things um, that also include the movement of films and their performance. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hello. Uh, you talk about the professional use of the 16, but you never talk about the, the private use, the amateurs using about the, the 16. Uh, I complete, because the, the success of the 16 millimeters is, uh, um, is go with the, re the reversal, of the, the system inversible, the reversal. So reversal film who, uh, uh, who represent an economy for the, for, for the for the pre for the printing for the amateur for the indi um, for the particular, uh, so the the person who watched film uh, professional film can can project uh, his uh, personal uh, personal movie. So maybe the, the success of the sixteen millimeters is a is a real reason, and maybe the the fail of the twenty eight millimeters uh, uh, in twenty. Bon, je peux, en français, tu traduis. <rire> euh, le 28 mm, la, la limite du 28 mm, c'était justement, et c'était que pour le, la projection de films, pro, de films. Enfin, euh, c'était surtout fait pour projeter des films d'édition, et euh, qu'il y avait la caméra, mais il y avait toujours le système du positif, tirage négatif, euh, du négatif, tirage positif, et, et le grand succès du 16 mm et du 9,5 euh, en Europe et pas qu'en Europe, et justement l'invention du système inversible qui fait que ça, ça, ça répondait à vraiment à, à une demande, quoi. I think I understood. Um, I'll, tr I'll try. If I missed something... Um, um, yeah, the, to, to me, what's been very important about this is separating the camera from the projector. So I think that the reversible film system that made it affordable for amateurs to use the camera, I think that was important, and particularly early on, but for a very small percentage of people, that 16 um, becomes a major force because of the projectors. Many, 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 many more people can see what they're making. And throughout the 30s, my understanding is a lot of them were reduction prints. They were still shooting on 35 in the 30s and reduce print, reduction printing them. So I don't doubt that the reversal function was important for amateur filmmaking. Um, but I, do, I think that it, it grows as a gauge and as a viewing platform on a different logic. Like, be really become something big on a different logic. Like, in the way that video did. Yeah, oui, 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 enfin, je pense que, euh, c'est vrai que, enfin, je sais que chez, chez Pathé, c'est vrai qu'ils ont, ils ont sorti le, pro, le, le projecteur 9.5 en premier pour donner cette, cette envie euh, aux gens de dire, regardez des films à la maison, mais c'était aussi pour... Euh, c'est une publicité quelque part. Vous pouvez voir des films professionnels, 
mais vous aurez aussi le plaisir de voir vos films, yeah. euh, vos, films euh, vos films personnels yeah. et euh, ça vous fait créer une, une, créer une envie, une, une émulation une, une motivation pour dire ah bah tiens je peux aussi peut-être que je vais faire du, bah, du, du cinéma du, je vais aussi filmer hein. bien sûr pas tout le monde mais c'est euh, et euh, je crois que j'ai oublié. Euh, oui, mais c'est vrai, vraiment le, le côté, l'émulation. Euh, de, 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 vous pouvez regarder des films, mais vous, pouvez, vous, vous, vous pourrez aussi projeter vos films, vos films à vous. Mais c'est vrai que c'était... Euh, c'était un, un loisir euh, luxueux d'avoir la caméra et les films, et ça coûtait cher, et il y avait une petite quantité de personnes. Ça, ça c'est vrai. Je pense que c'est une partie de la histoire, et pas une partie 